Welcome to Becoming Limitless. This is the podcast for entrepreneurs who want to optimize their life for freedom. I'm going to teach you how to upgrade your health, money, and mindset so you can have more energy, time freedom, and financial independence. I'm your host, Tanessa Shears. Let's jump in. Welcome back to the Becoming Limitless podcast. Today's episode is all about financial independence and money talk. And it's kind of fun. The guest that I'm interviewing on today's podcast, his name is Lucas Rubix. And we've actually run in the same circles for almost 10 years now. We actually had our personal training businesses at about the same time, way back in 2014, 2015, and have since had respective businesses that have grown in different industries along the way. But it was about two or three years ago, Lucas pivoted into a new business, which we're going to be talking about today. And I found it so fascinating. And I remember when I first was exposed to some of the work he does, I was like, what is it all? Like his new business is around decentralized finance, DeFi. That's the word you're going to hear us talk about today. And the reason we were so interested in it is we have been looking for a way to take our passive income to the next level. Because if you don't know, my husband, my family, and I, we reached financial independence Oh, just over two years ago now, which means all of our investment income cash flows enough to cover our day-to-day -day expenses. And so work is completely optional for us. Now, when our, our paths recrossed again, and I started asking Lucas a little bit about what is DeFi, I saw an opportunity for us to be able to scale our investment and our income in a way different way. And that's what we're going to be talking about on the podcast episode today. So Lucas Rubix is the founder and CEO of Crypto Labs Research, a crypto and DeFi investment research and training company. And it's kind of cool. They help investors not only learn about, but leverage decentralized finance. And like I said, if you don't know that word, hang in, we're going to talk about it, um, to help them beat traditional markets without the gambling and the hoping and the guessing and a lot of what comes with all the things that we think about the crypto space, right? And he does that through high level education, resources, training, access to the best teams in the decentralized finance space that manage seven figure crypto portfolios. Like it's really cool to start hearing about some of these stories and they do real time research to assess like early stage, what's going on, like being boots on the ground in this industry. And the cool thing is I feel like it's a really holistic approach where it takes a profit first mentality. And we're looking at being safe, smart investors um, and weaving in there personal development, mindset, wealth creation, right? Like becoming that next version of you. And why I thought this was such a good fit is because the way Lucas runs this multi seven figure membership program that I have actually been a part of for the last almost six months now is he runs it and he teaches you to run your investments like a business. And we're going to get into that, but it's so interesting that he is able to tap into what makes us successful as entrepreneurs and apply that to this game of investing in decentralized finance and crypto. And it's so cool having now been on the back end of it, I'm able to see like, oh, it's this thinking about the way we invest in ourselves and the way we manage risk and all of this stuff that makes us such good investors. So I'm really excited to introduce you to my friend, Lucas Rubix, um, and enjoy this episode all on financial freedom, decentralized finance, and how to become financially free. Lucas, welcome to the podcast. We've got a really fresh topic to talk about today. And I'm excited about this because I know we've been friends a long time. Like it's been over 10 years at least that we have known each other. And it it was just kind of this timing thing where what you talk about and what you're so good at was brought into my experience, my world of awareness. And it's really started to change stuff for me. So I thought you'd be the perfect guest to bring on the podcast. So welcome. I'm happy to have you on the show today. Let's go. Your energy. I was talking to Shanna two days ago. Is I value your. Um, you're always smiling and you're always great energy. Well, I mean that's that, that that's it's, rare. it's a product of the product, right? <laughs> that's true. That's true. You practice yeah. what you preach. Yeah, you bet. You bet. So, I mean, let's let's start off. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you, who you are, what you've been getting up to over the last couple of years that has gotten you where you are today. Sure. Sure. Um, I'll do the cliff notes. I'll do it really quick. I think I got into business entrepreneurship maybe 10 years ago. I was broke for the first four years of it, like most of us can probably relate. Um, figured out some parts of the game, went online, found scale online and nice gross margins. So I like that. Um, didn't really focus on alignment early in my kind of entrepreneurial career. I just focused on money and making money and doing something I thought I enjoyed. But I think I neglected the 
deep alignment work, the looking into my childhood and past and just really being like, why am I on this planet and what am I here to do? Uh, so the last business, I mean, it was doing okay. It was a seven figure business, but I was getting burnt out, tired. I wasn't in full alignment. I didn't know it at the time until I actually started realizing it. Shut that down. I uh, was fortunate enough to exit with a little bit of capital and spent some time in Mexico during COVID. Went all in. I was like, I want to make this money work for me. Mm -hmm. And every investment opportunity I didn't really like. And then I discovered this thing called crypto. And I discovered the dark side of it where I lost a bunch of money. And I said, there's got to be a better way to do this instead of these scams and everything that's going on and the fast money. And I just kind of studied Warren Buffett stuff and I applied it into crypto DeFi. And to me, it, it I just found a path that worked and got really sucked into it. Uh, me and Colin got together and said, hey, if we brought 100 people together who wanted to learn this stuff for like 100 bucks a month, it's something I'd be willing to do. And really quickly, we had four, five, 600 people who joined kind of this community we built. And then we started taking it seriously. And we said, let's just build a business company around it. Mm -hmm. And now, um, yeah, now it's just like this fun company that we get to do. And I say fun, I'm in the thick of things in terms of team building and you know, we're in multi seven figures. So there's some new skill sets that come with that on the team end. So it is fun yet challenging yet. I'm here for it. And I think business and money and investing is just a spiritual growth container anyways. So. Yeah. And you guys have been growing really fast too. Like even I was even, we were hanging out the other day and I was saying like, even your YouTube channel, since I've been watching it the last five months has doubled. Right. Like this stuff is really the way that you talk about this stuff. We're going to get into it. I think is so Let's fresh go. and it is so opposite of I feel what people think when they hear the word crypto. And I know that like, if you are either not even an investor at all yet, or you're just maybe dabbling or you, you know, you have some tech stocks or, you know, some things like that, like the word crypto, why does that create this like, ugh, uncertain feeling in some people? I think the media has spun it that way for a long time. I think governments like didn't like crypto because there was privacy coins, you could move money all around the world. You couldn't track that. And so they linked it to, you know, human trafficking. They linked it to drugs. They linked it to illegal substances being bought. But I mean, when you actually look at it, 99% of wars and guns and sex trafficking and all the deepest, darkest stuff you could think of is funded by the US dollar. Crypto is a very small percentage of that. And the US dollar is untraced. Like it's it's the stupidest thing, but the media kind of spun it that way. And then I think because anyone can get into it. You don't have to be accredited. You can do it with five bucks on an app and it's not regulated. You can quickly get scammed. And most people do, I have when I started. And so if that's your first and only experience of it, you're probably gonna think it's a scam, which is warranted because it is. 90% of it, I think, is is has no future. Uh, so I can understand why people think that. And um I just had what if I introduce myself like I was in a mastermind and if I introduce myself and let people know what I do, I don't blame. In fact, I take it for granted that everyone thinks I'm a scammer and I have to work through explaining how it actually works. And I just take it for granted that everyone thinks it's a scam. Perfect. And now my work is to explain it in a way that kind of clicks, makes sense and, you know, lets people explore it for even 10 bucks and see how it actually works. Yeah. And it's so interesting because literally when I started talking about this stuff that was like, this is what we're doing to our family. My mom shot over like she's standing in front of the TV with her iPhone recording like this man got scammed for. Se Are you yeah. sure? And so I totally get it. Right. But it's so I think when you don't understand something, one of our natural reactions is fear or skepticism. And I think that's most of us. But the the Big way time. that you you teach it is so different. And you said a word earlier on, which I imagine if you're not in this space at all, was confusing. And that's DeFi. What is DeFi? How would you break that down to someone who's never heard of this before? It's just like centralized finance. So centralized finance being, let's just say banking or private lending or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, everything a centralized bank, anything a bank could do, even get a mortgage, you could do it. DeFi, which is just decentralized finance, meaning there's no centralized entity like a banker saying yes or no, or there's no one holding your money. It's decentralized, which means two things. There's a something called a smart contract, which is worth Googling if you're into this stuff. Smart contract is a simple, really code. We'll call it a contract that if I click this, I get this and it's immutable. It's trustless. You don't have to trust the parties involved. You just have to trust the contract. And on top of smart contract technology, DeFi has been built, which means me and Tanessa can 
transact and I can send you $300 without a bank, without any central entity. And it costs about two cents. You could literally send $10 million. I don't have 10 million bucks, but I could send you $10 million and it would take 30 seconds to get to you. And it would cost about a penny and I could do it Sunday at 2 AM and no bank could say no, which I like because if you're uh, maybe you, you had a, shady past and you've changed, you've got a criminal record, maybe you went bankrupt once or twice as an entrepreneur, you can't get funding through centralized banks. Uh, DeFi kind of grants the opportunity, doesn't matter what age you are, what sex you are, what religion you are, if you got a criminal record or not, if you're broke, it doesn't really matter. You can enter the game and, and you can get funding. You have to give up collateral, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really, it's a smart contract. And it doesn't matter who it is. So there's like 16 year olds building multi million dollar projects online, and you never know they're 16, and their age doesn't really affect their ability to get funding because so much, so much of it is like they, you don't need your face on the internet to build these things. It's anonymous. So it's super, super cool to me. Of course, yeah. there's issues with that and scams, and you could get, you've got a, there's no bank that could give your money back. Mm -hmm. If you send it to the wrong person, you're not getting it back. If you get hacked, there's no insurance. So. It yeah. comes with its risks. Well, I think a lot of the the scam too on the public facing front comes from someone uh, people not understanding what they're doing or yeah. how to do it. So they give their money to someone who says they can do it for them. That's a lot sure. of what I've seen. Instead of taking yes. that time to understand it themselves, have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. It's user error is a big one, and then also mm -hmm. it's like you are your own bank, which is how I explain it. Is like you are the bank, and if you look at the flow of money which when I started learning about money and I was like, how can I get rich? Like, how can I get some money? I'm like, okay, hey, how does money work? And how does it flow? And where does money flow to? And it seems to flow from the uneducated to the educated. And most of it ends up in the banker's hands or in Wall Street's hands and in the elite's hands, because that's how the flow of money works. And then consumer debt, and we want this thing, we can't afford it, we buy it. Debt goes to the bank. So like, how does money flow? And I just realized bankers and Wall Street gets really, really rich. How could I become, how could I get tapped into that? And I kind of realized I don't want to in the traditional sense. And when I discovered DeFi, I was like, oh, I can be the banker and Wall Street and earn the returns that the banks would return by providing liquidity to the markets and literally become a banker. So I can do private lending online. I don't need to know you. You put up some collateral and I can lend to you at 10, 12, 14, 20% at times. I can provide liquidity. So Wall Street, meaning, um, you know, the participants in the market can trade and I can get paid fees on that. That to me was really cool. And that's kind of what got me started. Um, yeah. It's just kind of that really velocity of money kind of concept. Velocity of money as well. Like how can I get my money making me money working for me? And um, yeah, I mean, the velocity of money also got me. And it's like, how can I make my money work for me quicker, not mm -hmm. get rich quick, but most people who became wealthy, like if you're going to build a billion dollar net worth, I would say that you got rich quick. Um, so I, I don't have anything against like get rich quick. In fact, I think we should all strive to get rich quick. Like, can you get a $10 million net worth over the next 10 years? I, I do think anyone could, and that might be get rich quick to most people, but there's no way you're going to do it. If you have a hundred, if you have $10,000 and you go the traditional route, and you don't increase your skills, you don't build a business, you don't invest in things that can get you a higher return, you're probably not going to hit that. Not that everyone wants to hit that. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, I don't think you can really even think about retiring if you don't have at least a few million dollars working for you these days. That's just the reality of kind of the situation. And uh, I think a lot of us kind of, um, I did in my 20s, I kind of turn down my desires on the things I wanted to experience and the travel and the places I wanted to go. Cause I figured I'll just never afford it. And then in thirties, I kind of gave my head a shake and said, no, 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 I'm a human being and I'm built to desire things. We're literally desire machines. Let me crank my desires back up. I want to own the cars and travel to the places and do all the cool things and experience all the things. And let me find a way to make that work financially. And I don't know. It's so freaking, um, uh, cliche but it's like i just saw other people doing it and i was like i met them and i'm like you're just like me if you can do it i can do it and i hope that people can look at me and be like dude this dude's flawed and he's got all these things and if you hang out for me long enough you'll probably find annoying things about me and i didn't go to school and i don't have any of that but like 
I get to enjoy some cool stuff. And I think anyone can, like, it's not like we're asking for a billion dollars, a couple million bucks. There's more than enough for everyone. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the things that we share is a value of freedom. So while we're here talking yeah. about the money, like Lucas and I very much value, like, what are we creating it for? And it's not for when we're 65, so we can go live. Like we're very much about lifestyle now and how can we create cash flow now? And it's interesting, like back while we were in Panama, like I thought, you know, we've got our multi six figure portfolio and we're doing 11%. And I thought, you know, king of the world, like we're doing good. And it wasn't until like, you shared this velocity of money concept with Flynn and I, I was uh, talking to Flynn the other day, we actually downloaded the video you sent us on the plane it's ride cool. home from Panama. And we were like, we need to change some stuff because our minds had opened like, wait a second, this isn't a good return. Like this is mm -hmm. the snail pace. And so it was like, oh, we've got, we've, we've got to figure this out. And so it was that concept of velocity of money of like, the, the your ability to generate money at speed it does not mean you have to sacrifice all your time or work 100 hours a week that all could be part of it but you don't have to mm -hmm. and so that was cool and then there's a other concept i think that you talked about which is this concept of yield on yield which i thought right. was really cool i don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit sure, yeah that is and yeah. they both kind of speak to each other i learned the velocity of money from robert kiyosaki who i think talks about it quite a bit you can probably google it and he'll have some articles on it but it was like I, when I worked on the oil rigs, the, the company I worked for Akita drilling would match your contribution as a hundred percent up to a certain amount and put it in some kind of wherever they invested it. Basically I didn't make any money because the management fees were so high that, you know, your portfolio didn't grow, but I didn't know any better, but I thought, okay, that makes sense. It's free money. I didn't know much about money, but like if I put $10,000 in this year, they'll give me extra $10,000 tax-free kind of sounds like a no brainer. I'll just do that. And so luckily I built kind of like a six figure traditional portfolio um, fairly early on. I was 25, I think when I had that. And when I quit the rigs, I learned I could self-manage this thing. So I read all the books and I kind of found ETFs and kind of low index funds with low management fees. And I invested into that. And every year it did grow, you know, 10%. Some years I'd have an extra $8,000 in this six figure portfolio. And it was really cool to me. Um, never drew from it. Even when I was going through hard financial times with the first few businesses, I said, I'm just not touching this. If all goes to hell, at least I can live off this for a couple of years and figure my life out. And I still have it. And I think it's grown maybe by maybe like 30 grand. I don't know. It hasn't grown that much, but pretty cool. Um, and even if I kept that out for the next 30, 40 years, it might be worth 250 grand or something. I'm not sure. Not too much. Got it. Then I learned about the velocity of money. And that was kind of my plan, by the way. I'm like, well, worst case, you know, maybe this will be my retirement fund. Velocity of money being how can you purchase an asset? You know, right now we're looking for a home. And I was talking to a real estate agent today that it's kind of a buyer's market and I'm looking to get some free equity. Like it's a buyer's market. I can really command prices here. Maybe wait a little bit longer. If I can get a place and get free equity really, really quick on it. Sweet. Free money. That's how I'm always thinking. Velocity of money being, how can I get an asset? How can I get a business? And within two years, I own that business. I get my initial capital back and I can put that initial capital and keep recycling that same $50,000, $100,000. I can't do that in my stock portfolio, but if I take that hundred grand and invest it wisely and I can pull that hundred grand back after two years and still command that entity or still get that cash flow from this thing, now I just keep recycling that hundred grand and velocity of money works in your favor really quick. So people do it in real estate, um, businesses, operating companies, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Then the, um, the yield on yield was kind of built on top of that is how can I, we'll talk DeFi portfolio, but this is just even in a regular portfolio or whatever you want, but how can I invest in an asset, take that cash flow, and then take that cash flow and invest in the next asset. And within, you know, two, three years, four, five, six months, if we're talking DeFi, have multiple assets that are printing me money. So sort of both work together, but that's kind of how I think through it. So every time I get cash flow, I want to invest it in the next cash flowing asset and produce as many of those as I can and just have all these little money printers, money yeah. trees working for me. And yeah. over the next couple of years, like you can and and it doesn't have to be crypto DeFi either. I think this is this relates to any market. It's just yeah. I like DeFi because it's faster. Yeah. So velocity of money is, if I could break it down, I put a hundred grand in and it generates enough kickoff yield, whatever you want to call it to give you that hundred grand back. 
then it is continually producing basically infinite returns on money, right? That's for uh, the velocity returns, of money. Yeah. And then the yield on yield is the way I think about it is like when our traditional portfolio, for an example, if it kicks off $7,000 in that month and I reinvest that 7,000, now that money I was making, that yield is going back in and earning further yield. Does that sound right? Totally. Yeah. Cool. And I think with that infinite yield, um, you're, you're risk-free. And so you can structure mm -hmm. different deals or different, mm -hmm. I know someone who did that in real estate and the way they structured the lending that they gave to these deals was they got a return on their principal within 12 months or they wouldn't do the deal. So the way they structured the deal and they still commanded uh, vested interest in said deal. So maybe they still own 5% of that deal. So they were able to invest hundred grand, get the hundred grand back in 12 months and still have 5% ownership of that company or of that deal and do the next thing. And so over a couple of years, you've got the same dollar bill recycled and you're getting interest payments or you're getting whatever you're getting, however the deal is structured. So Sounds like a Shark Tank deal almost. <laughs> yeah. Right? So this, is, this, is the, this is the guy. And I started learning this. I was just like, Frank, these guys and gals don't play by the same rules as 99% mm. of the population. And they're not that smart. Like they're not, they're not they're regular people. different. They just yeah. see the world through a different lens. They play a different game. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I mean, now that we have that down, like I, I want to get into this, how you, the wording you use in your YouTube channel, which I'm going to make sure I link in the description oh. and in your program, which is cool is you talk about it as DeFi. So decentralized finance, right? So not centralized finance, DeFi as a business. So not looking at going in, gambling, guessing, hoping, praying, but you've taken your background, creating seven figure companies and been like, how can I apply this thinking, this strategies and systems to DeFi. And that's how you base a lot of your, your, the way you communicate in messaging. I don't know if you maybe explain to us what is, if you were to use DeFi as a business, how does that work? Sure. I think I started thinking that way because when we had entrepreneurs come in and I, mm -hmm. and they were doing crypto DeFi, they seemed to do a lot better than the people who didn't have business mm -hmm. experience. So I was like, Hmm, why is that? And they saw it very differently in terms of like, if you start a business, which I, I'm guessing most of your listeners are, mm -hmm. are potentially in that realm. It's like, it would be kind of crazy to even think that every month over the first year, or maybe over the first decade, you will be, you know, profitable. There's going to be some months where you spend more. There's going to be some months where you're okay. You have a step cost because you're buying inventory or a bigger office space. And you're going to have three months of higher burn and you're not going to be making the revenue to cover that step cost, whatever. Uh, or maybe when you first start a business, you're not even looking to pull profits for the first six, 12 months. And you're okay with that. And the more business you do, the more you kind of become okay with this. So I think they're, they were sharpened by all of the BS you face as an entrepreneur, especially for the first year or two. And then when they got into DeFi, it wasn't so emotional for them. They were able to kind of see it as a business, invest in their business, get the employees, AKA the farms and everything they're doing working for them. Yes, the market would sometimes go down and their equity or it would be worthless. Some months they wouldn't make money, but they understood that they're getting more ETH and ETH is just, uh, I'll repeat that, they're getting more coins and tokens. Maybe that's easier to understand. And maybe those assets they're buying are worth a little less because the market kind of corrects, but they're used to it because they've been playing the business game. So my hope would be that as people learn about DeFi, they're also learning to run a business and I'm aware of the emotional kind of turmoil that takes on you yeah. for the first little while. So yeah, we started linking it and then treating it with respect like you would your business. Mm -hmm. It's not just something you click on and leave. It's something you've got to manage and take profit on. You, yeah, <laughs> right. Take profit on, pull a salary for yourself if you want to um, leave a little left to reinvest in the business just like you would mm -hmm. in a regular business. And so I think entrepreneurs do pretty well in it or they get it really quick. And people who aren't, they are not only learning investing, they're learning business. And I do understand why so many quit on the journey because they just can't emotionally take it. And we're trying our best to make that process easier, but there's a element of you just have to get your teeth kicked in a few times and there's really not much I can do for you. Like it just, yeah. you have to. Yeah, yeah, right. Building kind of like a tough skin going through it and ability yeah. to like be able to step back no one to sit on your hands, no one yeah. to be patient, watch your emotions. So I think what I want to, where I want to go from here is I want to talk about 
the good side and the bad or the light and the dark side of crypto because it oh. comes with its risk, but it Big also risk. comes with its reward. And I think it would be irresponsible of us to talk about all, all the cool stuff that's going on in here without also paying attention to where the risk is. So, but let's start first, like, how do you make money in DeFi as a business? I know there's a couple of ways and like, I, I want to, I want to, someone to listen to this, I want them to walk away with a basic understanding of like, here's how I could make money. Here are the possibilities of that. And here's what cool. that might look like for me. I would say I would, I would um, at least mentally replace make money with how do I offer a service? Ooh, because like that's it. what we are doing in DeFi. And so think about all the ways a bank can provide a service and you do pay for it so they can lend money to you. And you pay an interest, which is right now around nine, 10% ish, depending on, on what you're lending money on. Hard assets like a house will be less, of course, but if it's for a higher risk loan or a personal loan, probably 10, 12% even. And so the bank is providing you a service and you are paying them back with interest, which is pretty high 10, 12%. You take a lot of risk in your traditional portfolio, you know, and a private lender, as long as it's backed by an asset, gets a pretty much guaranteed 12% with no risk. In fact, they want, the person to not be able to pay because they get an asset that's probably worth more than the than the debt they took. So you can do that in DeFi. Um, then how else does a bank make money? Well, every time you exchange different currencies, I need some euro or I need whatever. Uh, I get to every time I use my debit card or visa, someone's paying it. Maybe not you, but the the merchant is. Okay, we can do that in DeFi. So every time someone buys Bitcoin in decent decentralized finance, they are paying a small fee. It's only a couple cents up to a couple dollars sometimes. And whoever provided liquidity, meaning um, whoever put their dollars up in DeFi so there's actual liquidity, so things can be bought and sold, mm -hmm. we're getting paid those fees. And then the other one would be staking, which is a little more complex, but it's like securing a network with your assets, but the yields on that aren't that high. So we typically don't talk about it. It's mostly lending and providing liquidity. And I hope I'm explaining providing liquidity yeah. Well, I actually haven't thought of how to simplify that. So it's you know what the way I've always explained it. it to me because my my parents were like, "What? What? What are you doing?" I said it to them. I was like, "Mom, are you going down to the states next weekend?" She goes, "Yeah," and I'm in Canada. Keep in mind. And so I said, "Well, you know how you're going to take your Canadian dollars, you're going to walk in the bank, and there mm. you're going to walk out with U.S. dollars, but they keep two and a half. BMO keeps two and a half percent as a currency exchange fee to do that service for you. Right. That's what I am. So if someone walks in with their um, Bitcoin and says, I need to change this over to ETH. Well, I happen to hold both of those. And so I right. can act as that kind of like through point to turn one coin into the other. And I mean, if that, my mom seemed to understand it. So that's, that's the way good. I've been explaining that's it good. to people. You're, that, We'd call it on here. Part. Colin is the educator in UIG and he is brilliant at educating. He breaks it he's down. Got the best he's analogies. got the best analogies. Yeah. He's good. <laughs> he's good. Yeah, definitely. So that's kind of like the way I learned about it anyways, is like, okay, you are sense. the one, your business is the service. So I think the way I think most of us think of crypto is we only ever think of Bitcoin and maybe we might know about ETH, but we think right. about Bitcoin and then they do these crazy things where it goes really high and then it drops really low and then well, crazy all this. But this is different from that. This is the, the act of providing the service of changing currency so to speak yes. right is that how like okay yeah. and then, so if that's the process what is i know your approach is different than other people still but like what do you like to expect as a return on your investment with these type of pools yeah uh the bigger my portfolio gets i'm really happy and this is going to sound so absurd to some but like i'm happy if i'm doing 60 80 percent a year on average um if I'm doing four or 5% a month on the liquidity providing service, but I mean, with Bitcoin here, I went heavy when Bitcoin was 18, 19 grand. And so, yes, I'm providing liquidity, but we're also riding the appreciation of all this stuff. So on average, I'd say this year was probably a, a four or 500% return year, which I know sounds insane. That said, if you time this thing wrong, you can also see a minus 500% year. So you have to be aware of that. The further you zoom out, the easier it gets to comprehend all these big ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we can do on average, I mean, VFAT right now with all the stuff, all the stuff is doing. And VFAT is just a platform in D5. Right. If you're yes. listening to this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll simplify yeah. that. But yes, uh, if I can do, we used to expect, I used to set the bar at 10 to 12% a month and it's very doable still, but I think people were jumping in, having that expectation and they were taking on unnecessary risk and it was risky for them because they didn't understand what they were doing. 
So now I'm like, if you can do four or 5%, which you could do on even the big BTCs, ETHs, um, the big, the big coins and tokens that you commonly known with. ones. Yeah. And uh, if you want to venture into more volatile assets, you can make higher return, but the price you pay is your portfolio can fluctuate a lot more because these assets have less market cap, meaning there's less people, there's less money behind that asset. And so when the price moves a little bit, it, it, it moves faster. So if a hundred people sell something that's lower market cap, it'll move faster. And as long as you can stomach that, you can make more return. And it is truly a higher risk, higher return game. So you can get into ridiculous yields, but uh, your chances of losing your capital greatly yeah. increase. Yeah, I, it's so interesting. I remember when I was on one of the group calls early on, they're like, yeah, like let's conservative, like let's let's be conservative. Let's do eight to 10% per month. My brain almost fell out my ears because yeah. I was like, I do a year. You mean I could... Uh, theoretically, fast forward my process, 12x, right? like theoretically. And it just was like, this was what got me. I'm like, I, I have to make sure I understand this because right. this is such an opportunity. I think that not many people are really understanding like how how cool this is as an opportunity, right? And, and anyone it, can do it. There's, I mean, there's yeah. skill set you need to learn, but anyone there's can do it. There's a big skill set, I think, a, a big skill set that... I think people aren't willing to invest the time and energy because we're all busy and the system is literally created to keep us a paycheck away from not being able to meet our, like, I get it. People are busy families. We got, we got inflation. We got, we got real problems. And where do I find an extra two hours a day to do this or an hour a day? Like I get it. The system designed for that, but um, yeah, agreed. I think anyone can do it if you're willing yeah. to learn it. Yeah. So on the up. On the upside, there is that control over your own money. You move it where you want, when you want. You don't have to go through an interview to move your own money and then wait five days. Really cool. Yep. It has great returns on it if you are smart about it and learn yep. how to do it the right way. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about the risk involved because this is yep. this is not your S&P 500 investment here. It comes with more inherent risk. Yep. Yeah, I look at, um, let's just say you said you said you can make 10 times more theoretically than you can with your traditional portfolio. I remember sitting there and being about the same. I'm like, okay, I can make 10 times more. And then I started asking myself risk-wise, if there's 10 times more risk, then this might not be worth it. I'll stick to the less risky stuff. Cause really at the end of the day, it's that's simply not worth it. So the higher the risk, if it's 10 X the risk, I'm not playing this game. And I had to really think through mm -hmm. it. And when I looked through it and thought through it with the stock market being propped up by a lot of printed money, fake money, so is Bitcoin and crypto in a way, but it's a little different, at least in my mind, when you look at the analytics behind it. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, what are the actual risks? Well, a lot of the risk is user error. So I can I can control that. I can become better and control the risk. So that drops the risk. It would be um, hacks and exploits in terms of things I clicked on or things that I wasn't aware of. I gave someone my seed phrase or I clicked on a phishing email. Okay, I can control that. It's never happened to me. Then there's platforms failing. When I first started this game, I didn't really know enough about that. So I did have one day where it was like 120K vanished overnight, gone, never to be seen again. Um, yeah, right. And it was like, it was it was a little dark night of the soul for me of like, do I keep playing this game? That's when we actually doubled down on Crypto Labs because I'm, I'm a stubborn mofo. But I learned a lesson there of like, okay, diversify. I can control some of this risk. I can ensure that I'm invested in projects that have been around for a while that have really good security audits that you know have high amounts of TVL. I stupidly invested in something. It was a stable coin that was algorithmically pegged to value. And the thing it was valued to was the, you will have an appreciation for this. It was pegged to a token of that platform. And mm -hmm. kind of stupid when I think about it, because if that platform token started falling, then the backing behind the stable coin um, would, would diminish to the point where they couldn't pay back and now it would lose pay. That's basically what happened due to a hack, but that stable coin went from $1 to 12 cents in almost no time. And there wasn't much liquidity left over. So hindsight, I would never do it now. So I'm like, okay, I can control a lot of the risks. The only risk I can't control is what the market does. I can't control the price of Bitcoin and I can't control the price of ETH. But if I invest in things that have 
most likely long-term value that I think Bitcoin ETH will be here in 10 years. Even if Bitcoin imploded overnight and went to $10,000, if I hold it for the next 10 years, the chances are high that I believe anyways that Bitcoin and ETH will continue. Then I can also make an income while I hold this stuff. So that kind of hedges against the risk of what DeFi is. So anyways, when I looked at it, I'm like, maybe crypto DeFi is two times more risky, maybe three times, but it's not 10 times. And so now when I look at risk reward of investing in crypto for a 10x return for two or three times more risk versus mm -hmm. I think stocks are super risky. I think banks are super risky. I was like, okay, this kind of makes sense. I'll do this. So yes, I think it is risk. I think mm. you can get hacked, you can get exploited. You can get your computer hacked and lose your money. There is no insurance. You can get insurance, but let's just say there's no insurance. There's no backing of this stuff. We've seen the big centralized exchanges, which we don't touch at all, except to exchange stuff quickly. We've seen those fall and people lose their life savings in it. Um, if you have poor security, and you don't store your crypto in a safe, secure way, people can get their fingers on it. So most of it is avoidable. And if you make good decisions on investing in solid platforms, and if the platform is a higher return platform, but maybe it's a little newer, you just diversify and you don't put as much of your portfolio in that. Yep. So I think you can, you can mitigate the risks, but it's your coins. It's up to you to secure it. It's your bank. Like back in the, I'm reading uh, The Richest Man in Babylon again, uh, Babylon, because I reread that once a year. It's a great book. And they used to have little pouches of gold that they'd hide in their house. And if robbers came in and stole their gold, they were kind of pooped, you know, the luck. Uh, same rule applies here. I think banks are fairly new and we insure a house and we insure a car and we just want to be safe all the time. But those are pretty new concepts. Um, like in the past, like you were responsible for your wealth and your bank mm -hmm. and your family and your food. And maybe I'm old school, but like, I kind of like that. Like, I don't need all these people taking money from me and fees. Like if I didn't I have a couple of cars and if I didn't legally have to insure them, like I wouldn't. And if I crash them, that's on me. It's fine. Like, that's just how I think though. Yeah. Well, and I think like in given in all that risk, so like, I, I think the best way to kind of compare that is almost like if you do your investing through Quest Trade or your local bank or whatever it is like that, like they come, I know in Canada, I don't think it's a C CDIC, CIDC. Yep. It's an insurance that they give you. Like if something goes wrong, we'll, we'll insure you up to this amount of money. So there's not that if something happens with a platform. I think the right. other thing to address is like to get into this space, I feel like your mindset needs to be sound. And the reason I say that is I remember the first time putting money into um, just a traditional portfolio. Our first ever was BMO.to. It was a Bank of Montreal stock. We put $300 in and we sat there and I was like, it's up $2. It's down $8. And it was just terrifying because mm -hmm. it's, you, it, it's so new. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, you zoom out like, the average movement of the stock market on a day, we've been watching it for years now. It's like a percent and a half is like a kind of like, oh, that moved today. Mm -hmm. But there are days in DeFi where things can move 10, 20% in a day, mm -hmm. up and down. And then sometimes mm -hmm. just down and straight back up, like within the same Oftentimes, day. Oftentimes down and straight back up in a bull this cycle. This week has been a really good example of the down. Yeah. And it's, I think, one of the things that I think if you're going to get into this space, you have to be willing to work on your emotions and yeah. not make emotional decisions. And I think that's probably as the leader of the community you've built, you that's something you're always talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, that is a facing some difficulties um, within the business, which I think we can all relate to, right? We all put on our faces and we're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a pro, but behind the scenes, we're always dealing with some crap. Mm -hmm. And when I started linking it to, this is a spiritual practice. I'm not taking any of this with me. I'm not going to, I'm going to die. I can't take it with me. All the money and all the cars and all the success and all the trophies. I'm not taking it with me. Got it. So what is the actual point of the game? And I don't know if you experienced this when you kind of became financially free, but I remember just being like getting a little cozy. I was like, okay, I've got you know, million bucks plus to the bank. I could kind of chill for a while. And I started really questioning. I bought a cool car, my dream car, and I drove it for a bit. And then I was looking at it and I'm like, frick, this doesn't, any, none of this brings me happiness. I think we all know that. And I was like, what is actually going to, like, why am I playing this game? And I had to think about it for a long time and actually integrate it. But now it's pretty integrated where last 
couple of weeks, I've been waking up with maybe slight anxiety because we're, we're facing a new growth challenge and it's a new arena for me and it links back to childhood stuff. And so I'm working through some leadership things and, and trusting people and all this stuff. And I'm just like, what a wicked game we get to play that I get to grow personally and spiritually. And at the end of the game, over the next few months, when we figure this out, we'll probably make two times the revenue and have an awesome team. But like the prize is, even if I lost that extra revenue or I walked away from it, I grew. So I think DeFi and investing in general, like, great, you're making 12%, you got a $25 million portfolio, you're 60 years old, you get a heart attack, you die, you're 90. It's like, what was the actual point of it? I think it's like, it's a, it's a supercharged V12 that forces you to grow and just become a cooler, better human, yeah. uh, which is why it's so lonely sometimes when you're building great things because you're growing so fast and so many people around you aren't. So eventually you start finding people who are on that growth curve as well. Yeah. Oh, I can resonate with that so much. That has been literally the last six months of just like, okay, so we're free now. Mm. What do I actually want to spend my time yep. doing? And like, what is actually fulfilling? And like, it, it then becomes, that is, it's so interesting because this, this spirituality, which I have never even poked my toe into before is something that is like flaring up. All, there's like things all around me that I, maybe I'm noticing it more, but just really starting to recognize that this whole thing is a game that you get to get up and play every day. And it's just, oh, cool. like you said, another opportunity to become more of who you are. Right. Oh, I have actually, it's funny. I know this show is called becoming limitless, but I've been calling it the unbecoming. Mm. The un, like really all of the things, the That's things good. you were taught, the way you were, I, I I've gotten, I've gotten emails all week. Cause I've been really starting to post about a lot more of this stuff. And, uh, there's a lot of emails that are to the tune of like, I've always been taught that it's done in this order or mm. that you don't invest until this, or that you invest in houses and stuff like that. And people are struggling to break that identity that like, I don't have to own a house or I don't have to. Right you know, pay into an RRSP or a retirement account. Like what has been, I think Pretty cool. your biggest success in being able to shed some of those beliefs you were born with that you just like all of a sudden woke up to and you're like, this is not it. Right. Yeah. Well, first of all, what you shared there, I think is huge. Like we just kind of glossed over it. I know you're probably <laughs> like, ah, oh, this is, this is not my interview I'm talking about. I'm just like, dude, that's huge. Um, Like massive, mm -hmm. mm, super cool on becoming financially free so early and how many people it's available to in a short period of time if they change their way they think, which I guess is the question. I was really fortunate to have parents who immigrated to a country with no language and they had to become entrepreneurial and figure out how to mm -hmm. hustle. So I saw my dad hustle, rarely saw him, but there is a gift in that of like, he made it happen in a foreign country around people with a very different culture in Canada versus Europe in a small town. And they came from like a big cultured city that's been up in Europe for probably the last, that's crusades and like it's got rich history. We just ended up in some small town with a bunch of, with a bunch of hicks, which I, I love my hillbillies. Um, so I could only imagine they were just kind of like, okay. And, and a kid, like I was a one year old, like we got to figure this out. And they came when they were 28 and they retired at 50, didn't retire wealthy, but they never have to work again. They moved to Belize. They got a little home. I think they had about a million bucks. So if you think about that, like 28 to 50, like that's a short period of time. And they started with every, every obstacle you could think of and they did it. And that really inspired me to be like, okay, well they did, they set a foundation for me here. Um, they made a lot of sacrifices. We grew up in a trailer park and they were very frugal and that did instill some pretty bad money beliefs around me in terms of like, everything's expensive and I've got that still too. talk about it, <laughs> right? But, but their work ethic and their ability to like turn an idea into something was just normal for me. Mm -hmm. So when I quit, when I, when I finished high school, university and college wasn't something they talked about. They were like, we don't care if you go, like, if you go, you have to pay for yourself. So I didn't go. And then I went on the oil rigs which is not your conventional job. Like you work two weeks on, two weeks off. You have two weeks to kind of explore and figure things out. And you make a lot of money comparative to most 20 year olds. So I think I had a lot of time to like think through things. My dad hated the law. He hated government. He was very rebellious. There was communist Poland when he grew up. So he didn't trust authority. I grew up around that. It was pretty normal. Uh, he hated the banks. He 
You were set up for DeFi. <laughs> yeah, I was built for it. And then he left Canada at 50 because they were like, Canada, not to get political, but he saw the writing on the wall of what happened to the fall of Poland for communist Poland. So he's like, we're out. And then I remember him telling me, he's like, in 10 years, you're probably going to want to get out too. And I was like, dad, Canada's awesome. And now I'm like, yeah, we need to get out. So, um, I mean, Canada's a great country at the same time. But so I think I just kind of like was built for it. Uh, they were also very Catholic and I was kind of anti-religious and anti-God. So that like created a lot of questioning after high school and finding my place in that. So I think I was always like the weirdo. Even in high school, friends would be partying and I'd go drive my car up this hill so I could look over the city and I'd sit there for hours just like pondering my existence and the meaning of life and is there a God and what's what's the meaning of all this? So maybe I was kind of built for it. But uh, it wasn't until I started, so I did have a lot of money issues, consciously trying to get around. Like I lived downtown Vancouver and I'd go walk to that financial district for like, a, where is that? In Coal Harbor area to go have my lunch because I saw supercars and I saw Porsches and I saw guys in suits and just like doing deals. And I was like, this is so foreign to me and starting to do seminars and joining programs and getting around people who, you know, I asked people, could I see your bank account, successful people? And I'd see like $3 million in a savings account. And I was just like, my brain couldn't handle it. So I think all that started shifting my perspective of what's possible. And then, and I still, like, I'm still get around people who just blow my mind of, you run 18 companies. Like, that's so foreign to me. I can barely run one. Like, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Leadership. Okay. That's a skill I need to learn. Okay. Let me learn that skill type thing. Yeah. You know what I'm hearing? I'm hearing this resounding theme of, whether you put or your parents put, but you have been in situations that presented you an opportunity to grow, right? It's whether you went and you went down to the financial district, whether you went and sat in a room with people, you know, earning more than you, uh, running more companies than you, or your parents put you here in a situation where there was an opportunity to grow. And right. so I know you said that you were kind of built for it, but I'm thinking if someone wasn't built for it, what we can take from that is like, Put yourself around people or things or places that allow you to grow, that encourage you to grow, or that at least for me, it's always, I love this question I ask all the time. It's like, what don't I know that I need to know right now? And that was the last time we asked that. This is when our worlds collided again and DeFi came in. And I'm like, I never knew that was a thing right. that will change my life. Right. Right. And yeah, so I good. think it's like, it's like, what don't you know? Where do you need to be? Where do you need to, who do you need to speak to? Who do you need to be around? Yeah. 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 What? Who? Who around? I think that's the big one. Because remember on mm -hmm. the rigs, um, I was sitting in a circle with the guys. It was probably five years in, and everyone. I'm 25. They're all like 40, 50, 60, and they're all smoking, drinking, cheating on their wives. Like that's just kind of the culture up there. You know, drugs, all that. And I was sitting there like a 25 year old kid. I'm smoking my cigarette. Just had a swig of whatever I was drinking, and they were all like so depressed. And I was like, okay. If I stay up here, I'm probably going to end up like them and I'm probably going to cheat on my, and I'm a good person. Like I, I don't want to, but if I stay up here for the next 30 years, I'll probably have a family. I'll cheat on my wife. I'll probably drink every night, I'll probably do drugs and probably be like these guys. They were great guys. They were just, hmm. you know, that was their path. And I remember right then and there being like, I quit. Like I'm, I'm done hmm. and I need to get around different people or this will be my future reality. And then quit and I did have a mortgage, so I was following the traditional route. I had a place in Poco, uh, I had a BMW, and I quickly had to sell everything because I couldn't afford it. But to me, it was like, take two, three years of sacrifice, learn some new skills, get around some new people, change my trajectory, started joining seminars, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and uh, get around different people. And now I'm like, I'm, I want to be around awesome people who have great energy, who are doing different things. I don't care how much money or not they have. They're just like thinking differently and doing things not the traditional route. And those are like my people. And as long as I surround mm -hmm. myself with those people, we'll all, yeah. So I do think it's environment. Rising tide but lifts all boats. Fine. Totally. Yeah. And you know what? This kind of segues really beautifully into this is why I joined your community, the underdog investment group. Like this is not a sponsored episode for this. This is genuinely like, I was like, look, my people need to know about this. Um, but that's why I joined. It's because I, 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 you have an amazing YouTube channel, 
but it looks like a foreign language when you first land on it. And I tried to watch a couple, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what these words are. I called it deafy for the first three weeks. I had no idea. That's a good one. I didn't know that. I like uh, that. Yeah, I was, I, it was, I was literally looking at it and I was like, I know this is important, but I could spend years on like watch a video, Google 60 words, try to put it together myself. But I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge pay for speed person. Like yeah. the amount I've spent in coaching. And I mean, you can relate to this is like a, a good portion of my income every year. And so I, I mean, I joined probably, yeah. the community and like, I, I remember sitting on the couch with Flynn, like we're, we're a bit obsessive. We put in like, I would honestly, honest to God, two to three hours a day for about the first month, obsessive. And it was about week two, we started having conversations and it was like, you'd learn Spanish in two mm -hmm. weeks. And it was mm -hmm. just mind blowing. But beyond that, I think was the community. And like you said, being around other people who are also not perfect, making mistakes, losing money, making money. This is where I screwed up. Here's where I'm doing well. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that's always stood out is so cool is like your tolerance for, mm, I don't even know what the word is for, for people that choose not to rise is very low. So meaning like on a day where the markets swing really hard, it's very, um, it's kept very positive. Like there's not fear and doom and gloom. Cause I'm in a few other investing groups, a lot of just Facebook groups, but you'll get a day that moves up percent and people will be like, my life savings, it's over. Mm -hmm. They'll pull out, they'll lose a bunch of money and it really ruins the vibe of the community. So mm -hmm. when you're talking about put yourself around people, that can also be in a subject space. And for us, I'm like, I want to be around mm -hmm. a positive community that not only is learning me a skill set that is going to change my life, but at the same time, um, it, it's full of positive people, right? That's Doing cool. what you're doing, being in that environment. So like I, we've had such a good time in there. <laughs> Let's go. And I think I got to give credit to the team. Um, we all, and I know them personally, they know me personally, and they'll say I'm not perfect, but we strive to be the people we say we are and even lead our personal lives and as we are as a team in the way that we say we want to. And so I think as long as you have a strong leadership team in any business or any community, then it trickles down into the natural leaders within the community and that trickles down into, and anyone who doesn't fit that culture uh, ejects themselves and, and find somewhere else, which is fine. So I think it's, uh, we got lucky with it, but now when I look at it, I'm like, all right, it was top down. Like it was, yeah, it was built. built that way by having the right people. Yeah, you bet. Um, so let's, let's wrap this up. If someone has listened to this conversation, let's say half the words went over their head Half of them didn't there. Maybe they had a Google out very much the way I did, but they are, they have this belief that there is something available to them that they don't quite understand yet, but they know they want to find out more. Can you first tell us a little bit more about the underdog investment group, the UIG kind of a little bit about what it is, how it works. And then sure. if they just want to maybe explore before jumping into something like that, where else can they look for you? Yeah. And I'd say always start with free. I like that. I give myself yeah. like 24 to 48 hours of consuming a bunch of free stuff. You get an idea if you like this person or not. And if you don't, it's fine. So I think YouTube is a great place to start. It's Crypto Labs research on YouTube. Um, and you'll get an idea of if this space is even for you or not, or if you like, you like what we're talking about. But there's also a lot of other people on YouTube that you can learn from. And then the UIG, it was honestly built when I was in Mexico doing crypto DeFi, making returns, family and friends and people were asking me if I could manage their money. And I was like, I'm not doing that because I want to sleep at night. <laughs> what if I just show you what we're doing? And it kind of started as that. We used to go live once a week and I would just show people what I'm doing and people pay 97 bucks a month and they learned. And since then we kept um, finding ways to add value with the intention to keep it at hundred bucks a month. So if someone could try it for a month and if they don't like it, I sleep well at night knowing I didn't take someone's money they lost a hundred bucks. And to me, it's not a lose. It's like, you know what? I learned for a hundred dollars that this is not for me. And that's cool. Instead of charging like 20 grand or for like a big program. And then maybe, you know, someone realizing it, they don't want to use it. And now it's like a weird thing. So we built it that way. Uh, there's no commitments. You can try it. And we added a lot. I think we added too much. So we're going through a phase of removing a few things because it can be overwhelming for people. So we learned a lesson building a community that way. We got 1500 members. I think the members are awesome. But I think we just kind of let members select and, and people stay with us. So it means every month they make a decision to stay. So that tells me that people like it. And then we just listen to feedback of whatever people don't like, we make changes on, which we're kind of in the process of now. So there's lives, there's community, um, there's different research that gets posted. 
and you get access to the team that works with fast track clients, which they have six, seven figure plus portfolios. So you also get to kind of get access to them. And we're going to be bringing even more research from fast track once a week on a round table call into the UIG. So you can kind of hear what's working with the higher net worth individuals or the more committed, uh, maybe more financially committed individuals and kind of hear what positions are working this and that. Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing I'll add, having been, I've been in it for five months, just for framework reference, how long we've been learning. Um, I think one of the things that's become most valuable to me is um, because you, you guys have been so invested in figuring out and trying platforms and you guys know how to look for the security things like for us to be able to be like, okay, this is a more trusted mm. platform to use because you said earlier on, one of the biggest risks is that a platform just up and disappears overnight or a token just, I think, what's the yeah. term rug pull? I mean, it just goes rug up pulls. in thin air. So I think for me, it is that layer of additional trust in like, okay, I can do the research for myself, but also there's a community of people who are using it and that, you know, people right. to That's bounce good. ideas up, just that trust level. I think it's been very helpful. Um, we also invest our own money. Like I'm, we're not spreadsheet investors. So like we do invest our own money and yeah. anything we talk about, at least someone on the team has invested a sizable amount. So mm -hmm. it kind of, you know, we're not always right and you can't control what the market does. But if our money is a sign of conviction on something, then maybe that's helpful too. Like we we do invest in what we talk about. Yeah, I think that's so important. Always walk the walk, talk the talk. Very cool. All right, Lucas, this has been awesome. I hope my my goal was just like, if you're listening to this, you're just like, I have learned about something new that I didn't know about before. Or if you knew about it before, maybe it has opened up a way of thinking about it that maybe gets oh. you excited again. Yeah. I you think so we too. did that, Lucas? I think we did I, it. I think so. I think we nailed it. <laughs> awesome. So links for everything that we talked about, um, YouTube channel, the program, all that will be in the description. Uh, I'd love to hear your feedback on this. If you love this, come and say hi over to me on Instagram. I'm at Tanessa Shears. Lucas, what's your handle right now? At Rubixinator. Shoot a message. I am becoming an Instagrammer now. A few months ago, I decided to become an Instagrammer. Do you love that? Come it's on. just really sharing real life. and Totally. And then you know that the people that will follow you generally are interested. I love that. So totally. good. Awesome. All right, you guys have a beautiful week and we'll Thank talk you. to you next time. Bye. So I hope you really enjoyed this episode of the Becoming Limitless podcast and this guest interview with Lucas Rubix. And now you know a little bit about the words DeFi, a little bit more about the crypto space, where the inherent risk is and the reward. Like I really hope we accomplish that for you. And like I said, not only is Lucas a friend of mine, but I have been in his program. We're going on six months now. We've also upgraded to the one-on-one -on -one experience because I am just seeing this as such an early entry into such an emerging market. And I want to be one of the first early adopters there. So having said that, if you love this, I'm actually going to leave links to um, Lucas's uh, YouTube channel in the description if you want to jump over there and kind of get your feet wet and see what it's all about. But he also has an amazing program. And I'm going to make sure that I leave the link to that program, the Underdog Investment Group, in the description. Um, if you click on the link, I'm not sure when you'll be listening to this, but there will be a fun little discount for you if you're joining using my link because Lucas and I are friends. And this is just going to be such a great way, uh, way to grow our communities together and to help you know, entrepreneurs not only find that freedom in their life, but that financial independence so that their lifestyle expenses are covered and work becomes optional because then you get to start saying yes to the things that really light you up. I hope you have a beautiful week and I'll talk to you next time.